Okay, well, uh, today's speaker is Ilya Ozoskin from the University of Dulu in Finland. Um, where he's a professor there, but also the head of the cosmic ray station in Dulu. So, um, in addition to cosmic ray physics, he's also interested in long-term variability of the sun, uh, sun Earth relations. Uh, he's where he's the uh, co-director of the Resolve Center of Excellence, which is the research in solar long-term variability and effects. But today we will be talking about the extreme solar rays. My great pleasure to be here again. That's my <laughs> great, <laughs> great pleasure to be here again and give a colloquium. And uh, topic today is extreme solar events. What can we expect of the sun? This is a quickly emerging topic. And as this kind of events have been discovered only a few years ago. And today's talk is based uh, on the public lecture I gave last year at the European Geoscience Union uh, assembly, but it was updated quite a lot since during the last year there were new results and we had a uh, topical wor of workshop in Nagoya last fall where all the stuff was discussed and we are now preparing a book on, on this topic which should which I can announce now should be published by the end of this year. So you're welcome to read it uh, when it gets published. So uh, first, this is kind of introduction. Let me start today's performance with the name of God. Wait a second, hold for a moment, you're surprised. What? <laughs> what you think and God of mine, they're not the same. He gives he gives all he gives us all what we dine. He knows his name. He is thought to be with smile hiding in the cloud. Why he can be quite hostile. Do we know how? So that's uh, the solar physics was developed already in the ancient Greece, and that's is their theory for the sun which is a, a quadric drived by the god named Helios on the sky, providing every day the same route, providing the sun, energy, and warmth for all human beings on the Earth. Now we know that's not exactly like that, but that theory was fine for that time. And actually, we also have a record from ancient Greek of the extreme sun-related event on the ground. If you have ever thought, heard a myth about Phaeton, who was a son of the Helios, of the god Helios, and he convinced his father to let him drive a quadric. Quadric is really a big car. So he was just curious about that. And at some moment, he convinced his father. And his father let him uh, uh, driving the Quadric. But he was not an experienced driver. So Quadric went too close to the Earth, actually burning everything on the Earth. And uh, the, the goddess of the Earth, Gaia, plead for mercy, and Zeus, the main god, hit Phaeton with a thunderbolt, with the lightning. So that Phaeton died, and the Quadric was taken by a good driver, Helios. And since then, it was again fine. Uh, we don't know what was really that myth. Was it based on something, probably some huge trove, but we can think this as the extreme sun-related event, even in the, in the Greek myth, in methodology. Just knowing this story, I would not dare to drive Volkswagen Phaeton, especially if it's 
filled with the gas on a Phaeton gas station. <laughs> Probably people just don't know myth mythology quite well when they give these names to the. But that was uh, about the old. Now what we uh, have uh, these are images of the sun made from uh, space at Soho. Uh, a different instrument. What we are interested in here is the noise. This white called snow spots all around, follow it as solar flare or coronal mass ejections. All these white spots are energetic charged particle hitting the CCD of the instrument and producing noise for the camera. But that's what we are interested in, the energetic particles. And you can see the flux is quite high, and actually it's damaging the uh, electronics. Also can be dangerous for ost 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 uh, in, sp in space, since they are not recommended to go in the open space when there is an event. Uh, and in some extreme cases, it can be hazardous also for uh, Transpolar commercial jets uh, crew and and passengers. So uh, nowadays it's uh, low that the uh, radiation for uh, radiation dose for air crew is 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 monitored uh, to uh, to keep the occupational health uh, con to con to control for them. Uh, Normal way to measure uh, solar energetic particles and energetic particles generally is either on a spacecraft. This just gives a nice image of so where well, there are a couple of instruments measuring uh, energetic particles. And this is an image of a neutron monitor on the ground. This particular one, it's called DOM-C, is located in central Antarctica. Uh, at Concordia Station, and is the most sensitive ground-based instrument for solar energetic particles presently. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because uh, the geomagnetic field shields from uh, energetic particles, but not at the poles. So there is no shielding there. Uh, actually, if you can hear in some movies or even in mass media that uh, if the Earth geomagnetic field is switched off for some moment, we will all die because of radiation. <laughs> uh, that's not really true, because I am living in a region where there is no geomagnetic shielding in the northern Finland and still alive, so <laughs> that's not that bad, as you may. OK, so we're going further. Uh, this plot shows uh, energy spectra of energetic particles in the vicinity of Earth. The black curves are galactic cosmic rays during solar minimum and solar maximum conditions. And these color plots are uh, for, for different uh, Solar proton events, where particles are accelerated at or near the sun, either in solar flares or in coronal mass ejections in the shocks. Uh, so here, some typical spectra are shown. The green, uh, sorry, the, the, the blue one is the hardest known uh, uh, spectrum. So you can see that uh, there is quite a lot of high energy particles exceeding a few giga electron volts in energy. Uh, the green is a typical strong soft spectrum uh, of solar energetic particles, and red is the average over uh, all events which are de were detected on on the ground. Uh, typical duration of such events is from uh, an hour up to maybe a day. So they are sporadic, while galactic cosmic rays are always here. 
Here I show the two typical or most interesting energies. No, it's the average over all events recorded on the ground. If you plot the, the average measured in space, the energy will be much, much lower. That's uh, here I speak only about so-called ground level enhancement events. Uh, there are two, yes? Not necessarily. There are events with very weak flares like C class or even no flares if they are driven by uh, by shock uh, from coronal mass ejection. That's more complicated than just one to one relation. Uh, so here there are two typical energies. One is 30 MeV, which is used in a space weather. Uh, field as an index of uh, solar energetic particles, since this, this region of few tens of MeV is the most ha ha hazardous for uh, space-based electronics and, uh, and ost ost astronauts. And I also discussed 200 MeV particles, because that's what we really can obtain in the past using cosmogenic isotope method, of which I will discuss in a minute. If we put uh, all the data from from space era, which means directly measured events, and put the uh, the integral probability of uh, of events of the total fluence of particles, solar energetic particles with energy above three, uh, 30 MeV within a year. So this gives the annual fluence of the event, and this is a probability of a year with the fluence uh, above uh, 30 MeV exceeding a given value. You can see that it's quite flat, which indicates that there is no strong, strong preference for weak events over strong events, but there is a kind of suggestion for a roll off at higher fluences, but the statistics is really low. Here. This is one event, this is two events. So from the direct space uh, era data, from direct data, we cannot really say what we can expect worse from the sun in sense of solar energetic particles. And uh, this is the limit that during the last 60 years, we did not observe events with the fluence exceeding 10 to 10 particles per square centimeter in the energy range above 30 MeV. Uh, but we're still interested. Can we go? Can uh, worse events uh, can appear? And there were several attempts to ex extrapolate this relation. And as you can see, depending on uh, what statistic you consider, the difference is huge. Many orders of magnitude, meaning that we know nothing of extreme events from uh, this kind of, uh, from direct data. So we need to have indirect data or proxy-based studies, and that's where I'm going to, that we use cosmogenic radionuclides, of which the most useful are carbon-14, called radi radiocarbon, and also beryllium-10, and that allows us to study uh, cosmic, uh, variability of energetic particles near the Earth on the time scale of 11 millennia, which is related to the Holocene period with relatively stable and warm climate. The, uh, these isotopes are called cosmogenics for two reasons. First of all, they are radioactive, which means they are all decayed from the time of, of formation of Earth. And second, they are produced uh, almost entirely by uh, energetic particles in the atmosphere of the Earth. There are no other sources uh, of these uh, particles. That's why they're called cos uh, cosmogenic. 
If we consider an energetic particles, it can be of galactic or solar origin, very energetic coming into the atmosphere of the Earth. Atmosphere is very thick. At the sea level, we have more than uh, 1,000 gram per square centimeter, the thickness of the at atmosphere, which is very thick. Uh, so the primary particle cannot go just through the atmosphere to the ground. It should uh, collide with very high probability with one of the nuclei of atmospheric gases, uh, of which the, uh, it's mostly nit 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 nitrogen, oxygen, and argon. Uh, in such a collision, it's a nuclear collision, a bunch of different products can be produced. In particular, the, the target nu nucleus can be uh, broken in parts, producing uh, protons or neutrons or some nuclear fragments, which if they have sufficient energy can produce secondary collision, field free, and so on. Overall, from the top of the atmosphere down, down to the ground level, the average number of consequent collision is around 10. And this leads to the development of so-called atmospheric cascade or shower of secondary uh, nucleonic particles. There are also other particles like muon, gamma, electrons, but we are not interested now in those. And in each of these collisions, uh, some products can be uh, produced in particular, uh, beryllium-10, which is product of spallation of oxygen and, nit nit and nitrogen. And it has half lifetime time of about 1.3, 1.4 million years. Then it goes to uh, attach to aerosols and finally precipitates on the ground. And the best way to measure it is a polar ice cores, which has stratified layers, so you can measure what amount of beryllium was produced, say, 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago, and thus estimate the, uh, the flux of cosmic rays at that time. Radiocarbon is produced not in spallation reactions like that. It's produced when those secondary neutrons get thermalized and captured by nit nit nitrogen. Then it's NP reaction producing radiocarbon. Sometimes it's called uh, a, ne a neutron capture. Uh, after production, radiocarbon becomes oxidized to a carbon dioxide and takes part in the normal carbon cycle, which we know quite well. And finally, the best way to measure it is in trees, either living or dead trees. Because once the NO layer is formed, it's hold there. There is no exchange bet between different layers. So you simply count the den dendrochronologically layers in the tree, and you know exactly in what year uh, this radiocarbon was produced. The carbon cycle is quite complicated, but uh, we know it relatively well. <clears throat> to turn it into a formalism, Presently, around 50,000 years. So that's, that's 10 and a half Yes, yes. But uh, nowadays, they're measured by AMS, acceleration mass spectrometer, and it's really fantastically uh, a precise instrument. Earlier, when it was measured by decay, decay products of radiocarbon, they, they, can, they were able to go only about two half lives backwards. But now it's 10, 10 is doable. The INTCAL, the official record of radiocarbon, goes now to 50,000 years. Turning it to a formalism for, uh, of course, production of each isotope. Here I mentioned three and plus count rate of a ground-based new neutron monitor can be qualified by a so-called production function or yield function. So the higher is energy of the primary cosmic ray particle here, the higher is the uh, product, of course, because you have more and more uh, energetic secondary 
particles in the cas uh, cas uh, cas cascade. And then, if we converted this production curves with the spectrum of expected spectrum of solenthetic particle event, then we get something like that. So the uh, Chlorine 36, which is another cosmogenic isotopes, is sensitive mostly to energies around 30 MeV, which is good for us. Then both uh, radiocarbon and beryllium 10 have the maximum sensitivity around 200 MeV. That's uh, what we actually measure. And a neutron monitor has the, the maximum sensitivity at around one giga electron volt, even for solenthetic particles, because it has a quite a, a quite sharp pro, a production function. So uh, we can use then uh, actually, and then production is simply an integration over this curve. So just keeping in mind that uh, chlorine thirty six has sensitivity to about thirty MeV both beryllium-10 and radiocarbon-200 MeV, we can proceed. Further, chlorine is very good. Um, can you explain how you separated, <coughs> excuse me, how did you separate the cosmic rays from the solar energetic particles? Uh, I will come to that in a moment. Uh, <coughs> chlorine is good, but the problem is with measurements. It's produced at much lower amount than even beryllium, and measurements are very dif di uh, difficult. So uh, basically, when for radiocarbon and beryllium, we can go to annual resolution in the samples. With chlorine, it requires at least five years uh, of uh, resolution, simply because the counting is very, very difficult. It's much heavier, so sep a separation from isobars is much more difficult. Yeah, do you extract the chloride from, from ice cores. Also. also from ice cores, yes. Uh, OK, so coming to your question, how we do that? There is always production by uh, galactic cos uh, cosmic rays. And that's how we study the long-term variability of solar activity. But solenthetic particle events are very short. They can be considered nearly inst instantaneous at the annual time scale. So what we are doing, well, looking for spikes in annual data. And uh, if there is a spike in two in different series simultaneous, we can say this is probably a candidate for solenthetic particle events. If there is only one spike in one series, that can be noise, not related to the other series. So, for instance, here we see a quite nice coincidence of two peaks in two different series, uh, in N-grip and I-3 in beryllium-10. So we say, aha, this is a good candidate. But the problem that for this particular event, it was found that this is a volcano eruption, which simply precipitate beryllium very fast because of very big aerosols. So we should be careful also about that. And this is a list of candidates of events. That's the situation which was five years ago. A list of candidates of events. For one, we know that this is a, a volcano. Other events are here, a candidates in the event. And then the studies came further. And actually, out of this list of candidates, only one event. Uh, Sorry, two events were, were confirmed, <clears throat> these two. Others were not uh, confirmed. So this slide is outdated now. Uh, <clears throat> how it is done uh, also a while ago, actually only two years ago, a curve with an other list of candidates was published. This is the radiocarbon data. Uh, date, data. No, the scale, it's 12,000 years. So for instance, this peak is a typical grand solar minimum. It's not an event, because event is really short. This is one confirmed event. 
uh, the, I will tell in a moment about that, 775 AD. This is uh, another event. Then another event which is found now is, here you can hardly see it, all other events were uh, still under investigation. So if we put the list of candidates now uh, into the probability density function, it goes like that. So there is a clear roll off. And again, this is list of, of candidates, not confirmed events. I will show later about the confirmed event. And all, already it has a strong roll off. So something extrapolation like this definitely doesn't work. We would see it in the data. Now I will go about specific events, what we know. And the first one took place in, uh, there is some confusion here. It's called 775 AD or 774 AD. Confusion comes from the fact that the increase in radiocarbon was discovered in the year 2012 by a Japanese group. Uh, it, the increase was in 775 AD, but if you consider the carbon cycle, then the event happened in 774, and now it's uh, dated with high probability between May and August 774 AD. Uh, okay. If you're interested how it can be done, I will tell later, otherwise I go too, too deep into details. So that's how uh, the event looks in the, in the measured radiocarbon data. This is just the best base ground. Then there is a sharp increase within one year and then slow decay. But the event is very sharp, nearly instant. This is the effect of the carbon cycle. Production is almost immediate and then it gradually uh, uh, carbon dissolves in different reservoirs. So that's how we uh, see it in radiocarbon. And that's how it looks in different beryllium-10 records from ice cores in uh, Antarctica and Greenland. The blue curve here is what we expect from the radiocarbon. So from radiocarbon we can estimate the flux of uh, uh, of energetic particles, and then calculate what we expect to see in beryllium-10, and the red curve is measurements. That's, uh, the agreement is pretty good, and actually you may even see the 11-year cycle here in the beryllium. So this is the amplitude of the 11-year cycle, and this is the event. It was really huge. It's, uh, it produced much more within one or one year than galactic the whole galactic cosmic race for the same uh, same period so this shows that we are quite well in modeling the events but when it was discovered first in radiocarbon there were several hypotheses proposed for the origin of this event actually in the original paper which dis uh, which discovered this event Miyake et al. 2012, there was an error of the factor of four. So that the conclusion was the flux of solenergetic particle is too strong. It cannot be solenergetic particle events. So the, it was proposed that it's something like sup, nearby supernova. Then there was another idea that it can be not supernova but gamma ray burst. You really don't see a difference between it, just a flux of gamma rays, whether it's from nearby supernova or from a distant gamma ray burst. Then there was actually an anecdotic uh, idea of a cometary impact on Earth. So comet, huge comet, with the, uh, where radiocarbon is produced when it's flying, fall on to Earth, and all this radiocarbon was released. But the very Simple estimate shows that the size of this comment should be around 10 kilometers across. Can you imagine a 10 kilometers across comet falling on Earth in 775 AD? I think we would know about that. Uh, 
Penta was another strange idea of cometary impact on the sun, but basically it's uh, the same as solenjetic particle events. Because the first idea was that there were too much solenjetic particles, it cannot be produced by a flare, then we need something and it can be a huge comet fall, falling on the... But again, uh, we would probably would have records of such huge comet being observed in the sky. If it falls exactly on the sun, then the tail must be big. Well, anyway, so what remains now is that it's produced by energetic particles. And the primary candidate here is solenjetic particles. It's written so flare, but we don't know it's solar flare or coronal mass ejection or com probably a combination of the two. Or it can be a sequence of <coughs> flares, but within very short period, few months. Uh, and this was confirmed later by studying other ISA, other isotopes, beryllium-10 and chlorine-36. Remember, initially it was found only in radiocarbon. And for other isotopes, it requires additional measurements because there were no high precision measurements for that particular period. And then using all the isotopes, uh, uh, the group of Mikhail Dietal, an international group, reconstructed or estimated the spectrum of that event, 775, right, like that, uh, and comparison with the strongest hot spectrum event we know uh, directly, it was on, on February 1956, and the strongest soft spectrum event on August 1972, actually, this event was so strong in soft energy range that we were lucky that it happened exactly in between two Apollo missions. If it struck at one the Apollo mission, when the astronauts were on space or on the moon, that would be a disaster. But it was just in between the two missions. Uh, so uh, the spectrum is very hard. Remember, uh, this point, you even can see some small slope here, is from chlorine 36. It's around 1300 MeV. Then we have a point at 200 MeV from radiocarbon beryllium 10, and then it's just ex extrapolated. An interesting thing here is that if we compare the enhancement of fluxes with what we observed the greatest during the space era, at 200 MeV, this comparison with the strongest event we observed, it's a factor of 50. That's quite strong. But in the soft energy range, it's only a factor of three. And there may be a reason for that. Uh, that's a speculation, but there may be a reason for why there is so much difference. A 50 in high energies and only a factor of three in low energy. That uh, comes when we plot now all the known uh, ground level enhancement of solenjetic particle events as a, their intensity in strange units percent times hours. Uh, this is an integration uh, response of ground-based neutron monitor to this event as a function of the ratio F30 to F200 which is a measure of softness of the spectrum. So the soft particles divided by uh, hard particles. And an interesting thing here is that while for moderate event you have the full bench of spectra, hard, soft, whatever, for weak events but there is a tendency for hardening, but that can be a selectional bias. So we see only hard events. For very strong events, there is a tendency. The stronger is the event, the harder is the spectrum. So you don't observe very strong events, even in the space era, with soft spectrum. And if we put now 775AD event here, it goes like here. So again, very hard spectrum, high intensity. Uh, I don't I don't want to speculate much about that, but there is at least a theory as shown here, so-called called a streaming limit, which may uh, provide a limitation for acceleration of 
low energy particles. If their flux becomes too strong in the vicinity of a shock, they produce waves. And, uh, and they can be self-scattered on those waves they produce. So they are uh, scattered away from the shock and they cannot be accelerated anymore. And uh, there are some hints, no evidence, but some hints that it may work. Maybe it is not in full agreement with that. But at least that's, if this mechanism works, we expect the st strong events to be hard. Uh, then, in addition to this biggest event, we have two more confirmed events, 994 AD and 660 BC, and one more unconfirmed event. This still needs to be confirmed from other isotopes. This is only known in radiocarbon. We need precise beryllium and chlorine measurements for that event. And they go like that. Uh, now I put it as a scale to the event of January 20th, 2005, which is a very hot and second largest uh, observed event, but very well studied. That's why I refer not to the biggest event of the year 1956, of which we are not really sure about the spectrum because there were no satellites, of course. There. But this event is studied very, very well. Uh, so for 77, for 775 AD was roughly a factor 130 more than this second largest event. The event of 660 BC is slightly below. The event 993 BC is also about half of that big. The unconfirmed event should be of the approximate side of that. And here the red line shows the current sensitivity of the cosmogenic isotope method, because we need to go above the galactic cosmic ray threshold. And that the current sensitivity, probably we can push it a little bit down, but it's already a factor of 30 with respect to this event. So there is always an instrumental gap there, because here we use direct instruments, here we use very indirect. Uh, so we should either, probably we can enhance statistic in this range, but not in this. We need to wait for big events the sun can produce. Uh, and another interesting topic is that we can use even lunar rocks to study solar energetic particles. The idea there, of course, on the moon there is no atmosphere, no magnetic field, so it's hit by all particles, high energy, low energy, whatever, and there we get a very primitive spectrometer. Actually, if a very low energy particle, like solar energetic particle, hits the ground, uh, the surface of the Earth, it goes a little bit deep, millimeters or maybe a centimeter, and there they, it's either stopped or can produce one nuclear reaction there. That's all. If the energy is high, it can go deeper, deeper, deeper. When the energy goes higher, up to several hundred MeV, it can initiate the cascade inside the rock. So the deeper we go, the more sensitive we are to high energies. Of course, here also there are high energies. They also produce something here. But because of the spectrum shape, there is much more low energy particles uh, than high energy. Particles. So we get a quite primitive spectrometer, so we can estimate spectrum of solar energetic particles. But we lose time resolution completely, of course, because it's accumulation over the whole billions of years. Okay, if this is cosmogenic isotopes, it's balance of production and decay. And that's how we can go if we go to a deep part of a Apollo deep core, which goes to 400 gram per square centimeter. That's really big. Half of the atmosphere, roughly. Uh, the deepest part is totally produced by galactic cosmic rays. Solangetic particles cannot go, go there. So we can estimate the roughly a flux of galactic cosmic rays from that. And it indeed appears uh, on average larger than we 
uh, observed during the last 50 years, confirming that the solar activity during the last 50 years was stronger than the average. So the stronger modulation of galactic cosmic rays, the smaller flux of galactic cosmic ray. And then we can continue this modulate curve and simply remove the galactic cosmic ray contribution from measurements in the shallow part of the core. And that's what, what we get there as a, this blue shaded area is a combination of galactic cosmic rays and the best estimate for solar energetic particles as shown here. Uh, so for different cores, different uh, lunar rock cores, we can estimate the spectrum in, in this way. The red is one curve, blue, uh, blue is the other core. There is some uncertainty there, namely the erosion rate of the, uh, of the lunar rock. Because what, what you measure now at the surface might be a little bit deeper a million years ago. So we need to estimate it. But as you can see, this is the difference between solid and open. S simple, the difference is not big. So we can estimate the mean from lunar rock. And these are different estimates with a full range uncertainty. Uh, for one particular model. The, in, the interesting thing here is that these orange stars is what we get from satellite-based space era measurements nowadays during the last 50 years. And you see they're quite, they're consistent. Whatever you do, these are different estimates by different groups. They're consistent or even, uh, well, maybe here for one reconstruction, the modern uh, flux is a little bit higher than one of the reconstruction. All are they agree that that looks a bit unusual, not what you intuitively expect. We know that the, the activity was higher during the past 50 years than during than on average, but fluxes of solar energetic particles, at least in this energy range of few tens of MeV, is is consistent, and this is based on uh, on different isotopes, aluminium 26, which has a lifetime of several hundred of thousands of years, radiocarbon, few thousands of years, chlorine, around a million of years. All estimates agree with each other. That's, I don't know, that's what, what, what we get. And now, finally, if we put all together, this gives the, uh, the uh, integral probability density function can offer strong events occurring uh, on the sun, solar energetic particles. Can these triangles are the uh, space era data. These circles are confirmed now solar extreme solar energetic particle events in the past. And you see there is a gap here. And this point indicates that we don't have an event with fluence exceeding this value on the time, of, time scale of 10,000 years. I will come later to that. And this uh, hatchet area is what we estimate from the lunar rocks if we assume a they bull type of, of distribution of the probability. Then you can, it doesn't really matter. You can put it uh, exponential or Ellison Ramati or something different. It's all goes there unless you assume a power law. If you assume power law, then it will go something like that, clearly mismatching this part. So it should be flat in low fluences and then sharp roll off. All pieces are matching together. So can we now estimate the worst case scenario in the sense of solar energetic particles? The sun can produce. And here I refer also to the uh, Kepler-based study of super flaring sun-like stars. Uh, this gives some summary. So that's what we get for the sun. Uh, so uh, solar flare 
bolometric energy, which is observed up to 10 to 30. Three ergs and the probability of occurrence of such events. And actually, this is what, uh, what the Kepler gives. There is quite a big uncertainty there. And if we put some estimate for the uh, solar, solar energetic particle events converted into the, the bolometric energy, there is some uncertainty. Then we go here. So, uh, in a uh, paper by Clive Rattel, which is still uh, at, at work, they estimate for the energy of flare corresponding to 775 AD would be something in that range. And they, it occurs 1 per 10,000 years. So it can be put there. I'm not going to tell more about that, just, uh, but okay, you cannot directly one-to-one -one convert solenchetic particles event to flares, because not each flare produce uh, strong solenchetic particle events. It should be favorably located. There must be other fav very favorable conditions regarding that. So, uh, <clears throat> Basically, it can go a bit upper, but I don't know if about two orders of magnitude. Well, still, that's what, what we have. There are some estimates, at least. Uh, there is some very nice plot by Bridget Schmider, probably know that. What should be the size of sunspots to produce a flare with bolometric energy 10 to 33, that's what we get, 33, and so on. Well, this is, it, it can be discussed, but at least that puts it in, in a very nice uh, content. And uh, these two so, uh, I mean, objects are sunspot as the first known drawing of sunspot from uh, the book of John of the Worcester. Uh, they may be not up to scale, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but at least, so I'm not speaking much about solar flares because the relation is not really simple. But at least for the solenchetic particle events, just have, let's have a look again on this measured radiocarbon curve in female. This is the event of 775 AD. You can see the small spike here. This is event of 994 AD, also a small spike here. Uh, can we miss another event of that kind? Probably yes. Two order, uh, I mean, a factor of two more than this. Maybe not likely because uh, this is not a good curve to look at. Really need to go into much detail. One order of magnitude, definitely not. That spike in radiocarbon would be like that. We cannot miss it. So my message is that 775 AD event can serve as the worst case scenario. The sun can produce in solar energetic particles at least by within a factor of two. Still, we cannot exclude that we will find something like that occurring somewhere there or even a factor 1.5 greater than that, but two factor of two is already unlikely. One order of magnitude is excluded. And go to summary. Uh, so from the distribution I showed, we can put some practical limits. They are uncertain to maybe a half order of magnitude, but uh, Actually, at the time scale of 100,000, 10,000, 10, a million of, of years, we do not expect to see uh, solenchetic particle events with fluent exceeding 1, 2, 3, 5, and 10 times 10 to 10 particles per square centimeter. Three events are known now and started, one more still pending. Uh, I mean, it's 
it's observed, but still needs an independent confirmation. So far, the greatest event was in 774 AD with the fluence estimate like that, and it may serve as the worst case scenario. There is an observational gap between the extreme events and instrumental era events. And I didn't discuss much, but a possible climate effect of this huge event uh, can be notable only on the regional scale. There are some modeling, not, a, not on a global scale. But in, in a regional scale, it can produce some, some small effects. But technological effects would be dramatic for our technological society. Thank you. One of the questions that's been bothering me for a long time, you pointed out that not all players have energetic particles with them. Did the Carrington event leave any trace? No. Uh, we don't have any confirmation of a strong solenergetic particle event for the Carrington flare. You maybe have heard a while ago about the nitrate record. It's a chemical um, uh, chemical record uh, which was proposed to reflect this solar energetic particle events in low energy range, but it was shown by many studies that it doesn't work. It was just a coincidental uh, agreement because of the spike in one of the Greenland uh, uh, ice core series in night nitrate around the year 18. Uh, 1860 was caused by the uh, plume of uh, of uh, a biomass burning from Europe, because it contains not only nitrates but also ammonia, black carbon, all other stuffs which cannot be produced. So no, we don't have any uh, record or, or any confirmation of a strong solenergetic particle event in the. But again, we are here sensitive to energies uh, of around 200 MeV, so for hot spectrum event. We cannot exclude there was a soft spectrum event. Uh, would there be an expectation of a strong aurora from this uh, event? Not necessarily. There were some studies, at least there is no Aurora, there were some observation of auroras during that period, but there is none uh, corresponding in time to that. So that's interpreted as uh, there was some enhanced activity on the sun, but you don't really expect a one-to-one -one relation between geomagnetic storm and, uh, and solar energetic particle. As for the greatest event of the year 1956, the geomagnetic storm was very weak. And for the Cunnington event, we don't have as, which was the greatest geomagnetic storm, we don't have record of solenergetic particle. But yet there were some aurora within plus minus one, one, one year observed also at, at mid latitudes and even lowish latitudes. Yes. The
Uh, AMS, you mean? Oh, okay. Yeah, concerning your comment, yes, I didn't. Sure, but uh, for the strong geomagnetic storm event, you should expect a CMA coming from the center of the disk. And for a very effective solenetic particle events, it should be west west leap. So it can happen to hit with the flank, but not with the with the central part of. You mean this? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. First of all, there is of course discrepancy between the individual measurements. That's why we want to have many. Uh, but typically, measurement error is of the order of one, two, per mil here. This is not a measurement error. Uh, this is if you this this uh, curve came from. Poland. There is another uh, measurements from uh, Lap uh, from Lap uh, Lapland, which goes like that or even higher. This is called the polar enhancement. Uh, it has two origins. First, of course, all cosmogenic isotopes by solenetic particles are mostly produced in polar region, and what caught here, it's almost immediately produced, so there are more in polar region. Another is the uh, the pattern of the uh, atmospheric circulation is so that uh, the part which is produced in the st uh, st uh, stratosphere goes down to the troposphere, mostly in the uh, mid-latitude, mid, mid to high, around 50 Degrees. So we do, uh, and this is known when you go into details, then you see that there is slightly higher uh, response we expect in mid latitudes and high latitudes than in equatorial or low latitude. So this difference is real. All other is mostly related to the. Also, there is another thing. If you see, there is also the New Zealand curve here. In southern atm atmosphere, the signal is a bit weaker because of the uh, much more ocean and smaller land, land fraction. And ocean, ocean dumps the signal more effective than, than land. So yeah, uh, there is a discrepancy. Uh, and well, that's real, and thanks for sharp eye. <laughs> sailing. If they were flying over a uh, bomber, they would be <laughs> shut down by the wind. So what I'm concerned about is while I understand the rationalizations why certain cosmological non-solar uh, events known uh, cannot possibly have created this jump. The, the fact that 
friends. We events or significant events uh, on the sun that we know of in the last 150 years in no way uh, have made any kind of dent in, in the carbon 14 uh, production. That also to me leaves some room for doubt okay. whether super flares or whatever you want to identify of the sun really is the cause uh, of this. Okay. Uh, so we should uh, have, well, first of all, uh, with multi proxy measurements with different isotopes, we are sure that this was a energetic particle events because for any other like uh, gamma ray burst or supernova I understand yes that, but, but the yeah. things hear me. Uh, yes those were energetic particles but you are hardly pressed to uh, find uh, a scenario uh, on the sun to actually create these kind of uh, oh, that's a quantitative dif difficulty to create a spike nearly instantaneous of energetic particles of non-solar origin. They have even qualitative uh, difficulty. It cannot be coming from outside. Uh, you cannot get an enhancement shorter than a few months if it's coming from outside the solar system. Uh, also, one may think of uh, maybe geomagnetic field switching off, but again, few months is that's impossible. So what we can really get out from there, it's energetic particle spike with a duration shorter than several months. And then what what else left than a solar energetic particle? I'm not convinced. I mean, it's <laughs> great advocacy for solar physics, of course, but uh, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs>